السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. جزاكم الله خير ورحمة for joining us tonight to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept and reward you inshallah rahmeen for the time that you spared for his sake. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless Shaykh Muhammad Yatha for coming all the way from Halifax, the other side of Canada. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and bless his family for sacrificing uh, him and his time to be with us tonight inshallah and to be with us also tomorrow and after tomorrow bi'ithnillah at the Generation Muslim Conference inshallah rabbil alameen which is happening in Surrey there are flyers for that outside and I think there's a brother here as well that has some tickets inshallah rabbil alameen that he can share with us inshallah so uh, without uh, further ado inshallah I'll just give you a brief bio of uh, Sheikh Muhammad Yafa Sheikh Muhammad Yafa studied Islam and Arabic language and literature in Southeast Asia and in the Arab world, mashallah. He's an educator and the director or a director at the Center of Islamic Development, CID in Halifax, where his experience in conveying the message of Islam and teaching works are based. At the Islamic Center, Imam Yafa also conducts leadership and community development and supports programs and workshops for members of the community, especially the youth. Um, you'll find that Sheikh Muhammad Yafa will share some lights of wisdom, inshallah, Rameen, that we hope to benefit from. So let's give him an attentive ear, inshallah, Rabbi Alameen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and reward you for your time. Barakallahu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Nahmaluhu wa nasta'imhu wa nasta'afruhu wa natubu ilayhi. Wa na'udhu bihi min jururi anfusina wa min sayyi'ati a'malina. من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا My dear brothers and sisters, it's indeed a pleasure to be amongst you tonight and uh, I've decided that we'll just uh, sit and uh, have the intention of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that never will a group of people sit in a house of Allah. Uh, they are reading the Quran and studying it amongst themselves, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them many favors, including that the angels will come down. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the angel of Rahmah descend upon us here and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them tranquility. There is a lot of stress and um, problems in our lives. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us tranquil life from here and into our homes. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also mention them amongst the ones that are with him, meaning the Malaika. So we will make the headline news to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, when people are so proud of seeing themselves on the, on the news cover, so uh, without any comparison, we just think of we being positively mentioned in the, in the news on the, on the cover, just like we're hearing here and there, how that feels. So right now, if we sit here with the right intention, this is happening, and Allah is telling his angels, look at my servants, what they are doing. So, when we find ourselves in places like this, whether it is Juma or lecture, we have to bring that consciousness with us and hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us those favors. Many times people come to Juma and when they leave, uh, they say, well, the Imam wasn't very articulate, the Imam was not translating in Arabic or he was not translating in English or he's very boring or he's... So you, you are in the masjid for more than just understanding what the Imam is saying. You are in the masjid to multiply your ajr and to get that kind of position to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you will see your al qiyamah. Uh, maybe somewhere your name is hanging that Fulan and Fulan was, was present at such and such lecture, at such and such khutbah. So we ask Allah to give us that your al qiyamah. I wanted to talk um, about something very important and that is urgency, to be urgent in life. And I'm going to just be the light Allah, by the will of Allah, talk about a couple of uh, revelations in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talked about being urgent being on your toes, 
having a goal and working towards it and doing it fast because life is short. Allah says in the Quran, Allah says, hurry to a forgiveness. Hurry, rush up towards a forgiveness from your Lord. And Allah called it a forgiveness and then he described the forgiveness in a way that makes it real. He said, this, the size of this forgiveness, Abuha, the width of it, and he used what the Arabs called At-Tashbihul Mu'akkad, which is the simile that is emphasized when you compare two things, but you take the article of comparison. So, you didn't say it's like, you didn't say similar to, you just said this is this. He said the width of it, as samawat wal ard is the heavens and the earth. So imagine this, the heavens and the earth is the width of the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the forgiveness is translated into what implies Jannah. So rush to Jannah and the size of Jannah is the width of the heavens and the earth. Now with all the technology and the knowledge we have, nobody knows the width of the heavens and the earth. So we know the width of the earth, we know something about the earth, but the heavens, and we say, it keeps expanding. So this Jannah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about is mysterious to us because we have not practically seen it, touched it, smelled it. And there is nothing to be compared to it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, فِيهَا مَا لَا عَيْنُ رَأَتْ وَلَا أُدْنُ سَمِعَتْ وَلَا خَطَرَ عَلَى قَلْبِ بَشَرْ Say, in the Jannah, there is what no eye has ever seen. So if you have seen beauty, wait until you get to Jannah. And there is there what the air has never heard of. The Quran mentions so many things. Rivers of honey, rivers of milk, rivers of, of water, rivers of many, many other things. He mentions men and women and angels and beauty and width and, and all kinds of things. But still, Rasulullah said, your ears have not heard everything that is in general. And not only your ears have not heard it, it has not even occurred to your mind. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to go to, sariru, to rush to. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to be urgent. But how can we be urgent towards Jannah? That is explained in the other part of the ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِي it has been prepared for the muttaqin, the people who have consciousness of Allah. And then he goes on to describe them, what are the characteristics of the people who have consciousness. He said, الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ The ones who spend during times of adversity and during time, times of prosperity. So, to them, the spending is not something that comes time to time. In their wealth, there is a known portion for the people who are asking and the people who are deprived. So they spend, whether there is adversity, whether there is prosperity, 
there is always something that they can spend for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is always something that they can spend to build the institutions that serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is always something they can spend to lift people up. There is always something that they can spend to take people out of poverty and difficulty. So these are this this is the way to rush to the maghfirah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alladina yufiquna fi sarrai wa dhurra wal kaadhimina ghayb and the ones who suppress their rage. See the human heart is prone to anger. Is prone to anger. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warned us against working upon our anger. A man came to him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and imagine the one who was given the Quran and the hadith. Somebody came to him and said, advise me. He said, don't get angry. He said, okay, I get that. I need more. He said, don't get angry. I get it. Anymore, he said, do not get angry. So three times, the man is asking. Three times, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is giving him the same response. Now you can say, maybe this man had issues. It is true, he had issues. If that is the case. But for three times, the Prophet sallallahu told him, and this has been narrated to us, so it holds a great significance in building our character. And what happens with anger and rage, if you do not control it, you either take it outside or you take it inside. And it brings balba, it brings shakiness in relationships between fathers and children and mothers and and children and husbands and wives. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, one way to earn Jannah is to consciously control your rage for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether the encounter is between you and someone close, someone further, al min al And he said, wal nas and the ones that forgive people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like people who work towards excellence. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says rush to this, it's like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I have for you this big thing with very simple, cheap price. So we are in the season where they call us for sales, right? So sales are everywhere these weeks. Practically, there are sales everywhere. So everybody is heading to the stores to buy things for cheap. Um, I personally know some people who delayed their buying of their jackets until this time because the prices go down. And uh, people go into debt this time to, to get the best deals. So will you go into debt for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to get this big deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So it's, it's, it's a, for dunya we always, it's very easy, it comes very easy. For dunya we, you know, we, 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 there is no complaint. I can go into debt and sometimes when I hear people people pay interest for the dunya. But we always have reasons why we cannot give for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, uh, that must the imam is this. Oh, this brother, I had an argument with him. Oh, I don't have much money. You will never have enough. We know that, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes us that for the love of wealth, we are shadid. We are very strong. Very, you know, when it comes to wealth, nobody wants to let go. That is just, that's the nature. There is no pretense of otherwise. But it's when you can overcome that and give. That is one way of rushing and being urgent and not delaying it. It is mentioned that the Prophet at one time prayed us and against his habit of sitting and doing dhikr, he rushed into his house. 
Because mind you, the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was connected to the masjid. Right? That is how we get the, the grave of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam within the, the, the al masjid in Nabawi. Because the, the grave, uh, the, he was buried where he died, which happened to be his house, and then the masjid became bigger and engulfed the house. So he went into his house. So that was against his character. And when he was asked, he said. I had a piece of gold that was supposed to be Sadaqa that I had forgotten. So he could not delay another second. Even the Baqiyatu Salihat, he didn't sit to wait for it, he went to spend it. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us. Whenever there is khayr, to rush to do it. The, the other wahay, the other revelation is a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in which he says, and the hadith has been narrated by Ibn Umar, he said, Kun fi dunya ka anna ka or agri sabil. See, be in this dunya, in this world, as if you are a stranger, a wayfarer. So this is another simile. So the stranger and the wayfarer, the person who is traveling, they behave differently from the person who is a resident, who is in the our city. Some of the differences are, they don't let their luggage loose. You don't go as a stranger, and you take all your clothing and hang them all over the place and throw your shoes around. You always, you are guarded. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is saying, be in this dunya like that. Do not let yourself loose. Do not go into the mode of kafla, the mode of forgive, forgetfulness. Know that you have a purpose, know that there is a goal, know that there is somewhere you have to arrive at. So always be on the go for that. Or somebody who is wayfarer, you are traveling. A traveler does not go to a place while transiting, he buys land and big land and increases the land. You transit it. This world is a transit. Well, I don't say no sleeper coming at dunya, you take from this dunya what you, what you need. And the rest, whether you want it or not, you're going to leave it. So get ready for the way ahead of you. So don't feel too comfortable. Be in a hurry. The gharib is not comfortable because their goal is ahead. Ibn Umar, radiallahu anhu, it was narrated that when he read this hadith, the hadith stops right here. Kun fi dunya ka anna ka gharib or so Ibn Umar was saying, if you wake up in the morning and you have something to do, do not wait till the evening. And if you find yourself in the evening, do not wait till the morning. Every minute, walking the dog, finding all kinds of means, going to the gym, eating healthy, lifting weight, trying to immortalize yourself, trying to look young, all good. So what? You run away from it, it's going to face, meet you head on. So the death does not follow you. You actually, it meets you ahead of you. That is the, that's the reality of it. It's not, it doesn't follow you, it meets you head on. And you never know when it comes. And uh, Nobody has a signature with Allah in agreement that I have 80 years or 90 years or 100 years. So you don't know. That's a secret that you'll never know. So what you have to do, do quick. The third one, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Badinu bil a'mali fitanan kaqita'i al-layl al-mudlim. He said, rush ahead with your good actions against fit and trials that are like the dark night. These trials are like the dark night. Someone may wake up in the morning as a believer, but then by the time the evening comes, they have lost their Iman. And in the evening they are mu'minin, the Iman, the level is high, and by the time it is daybreak, the Iman is gone. Fitanan kapitu'i dayl al-mughlin yusbihu al-rajulu fihi 
مؤمنا ويمسي كافرا ويمسي مؤمنا ويصبح كافرا يبيع دينه بعرض من الدنيا قليل he said people would be selling their dunya with something very little so you come to Fajr for example with good intention you make your wudu you walk you take the steps you come to the masjid you line up for salah you pray you leave the masjid and you get distracted you go to the market you look you look at haram you do haram you eat haram you drink haram for the whole day you've forgotten that this is the person who the first thing they did in the morning was to go and meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their salah. Or in the night, you are mu'min, and then in, in the evening, and by the time they break, sitting in front of the TV, in front of the computer, on the cell phone, watching this, watching the other, seeing haram, listening to haram, talking haram. So the fitna is right here. So Rasulullah is saying, the way to counter this is to look for avenues to do goodness. Badru bin A'mal. So anytime, anytime they say there is this goodness, you step in with the little you have. This is the only solution. There is work here, you step in. There is poor person here, you step in. There is this thing to be clean, you step in. This is the way to do it. We have to look for the avenues to do goodness. This is the way we escape the fitna, as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. Say, because when the dunya gets opened, we'll be selling the dunya, with, we'll be selling the deal with this small dunya. For money, for position, for properties, for ambitions, for many, many other things. This is the advice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is also a worldly benefit for doing good things for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I'm going to end with this inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Anbiya wa Zakariya ibn Nada rabbahu rabbi la tadarni farda wa anta khairul warithin fastajabna lahu wa wahabna lahu yahya wa aslahna lahu zawja إنهم كانوا يسارعون في الخيرات ويدعوننا رغبا ورهبا وكانوا لنا خاشعين. الله سبحانه وتعالى said about Zakaria who had grown older but did not have a child and he was thinking of leaving a legacy. Allah has given him wah and he had preached but his fear was he will die and leave this dunya without leaving anybody to carry this message. So he prayed to Allah. He said, Rabbi la tadarni farda. Oh Allah, don't leave me alone. Oh Allah, do not leave me alone. Wa anta khairul warithin. Although you are the one who, who, get, has, who has every legacy. So you are the one who will take over. You actually don't need anybody to take the din over. But don't leave me alone. I want to see as a human being somebody to whom I can pass on this message. This is the dua he made. Allah said, Fastajabna Allah. We responded to him positively. Allah answered him. At an old age, Allah gave him a child. And we gave him Yahya who became another prophet who carried the message. And Allah said, And we maintain his wife for him. Look at this. We don't know what the relationship was between him and his wife, whether something was wrong with his wife or not, whether there was something he did not like about his wife or not, because they were human beings too, the prophets. But, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of his dua and because of something else that we will read soon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a child and made his wife even better. So he would look at his wife and feel even happier. Something that many of us family people are lacking today because we really don't invest what it needs to be loving to our families. Then Allah says, here's the reason. 
وَيَدْعُونَنَا رَغَبًا وَرَهَبًا They, he made dua alone, the father. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a child. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed his wife as well. He said, they, as a family, they were always rushing to do good things. As a family. It is proven that the struggle is harder when one person in the family is the one who is serving the deen, is the one who is caring for the children, is the one who is setting the goals. It is easier when the wife, the children, the father, they all sit and talk about what they want to do and they do khayr together. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless those kinds of families. Inna umkami yusari una fil khayrat they used to rush to do goodness. They used to look for avenues to do goodness. And they will call upon us. Allah is saying, Rahaban out of want, Rahaban and out of fear. So there was open desire, but there is also fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they were dedicated in their call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there are many, many lessons in this, one of which is families need to pray together families need to pray together brothers and sisters if you delay some of your sunnah the problem is we hardly catch sunnah in fact so things like isha if you have family at home after praying isha you return home you pray with you with your family and when you have difficulty you share with your family and you make dua with your family. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about Zakaria and Yahya and his wife. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to them positively because they were rushing to do good work. Wherever there is an avenue of khayr, they were there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and guide our families and give us strength. Uh, those are my words for tonight. If I make any sawab, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If there is any mistake, it's definitely from me. And uh, I'll open the floor if anybody has a comment or question, inshallah ta'ala. If we have the answer, we'll give it. If not, that, if not we'll, we'll refer it to the Mama in the room if we don't have answers. Jazakumullah khair. So, looking, brother. Um, maybe you can just share something about the Muslim community, your community in Halifax, so we can get to know them a little bit through you. A few words. So, the brother is asking for me to share something about the Muslim community in Halifax. Um, I, I, I don't know how to compare it with the community here because I, 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 I don't live here, but I was talking with Brother Muhammad Anaj who drove me here about uh, the community there. Uh, the Muslim community in Halifax has been there for a very long time. Uh, they started in a, in a small town called Truro. Uh, it started with the Lebanese uh, people who, who settled there and they built a masjid and they bought a little piece of land which became the cemetery uh, up to now and the place is called Bible Hill. So up to now, when somebody dies in Halifax, so it's an hour travel outside, and an hour travel is a long travel from Halifax to go to go bury the person. I, I, I usually make this joke. I say the Muslim burial ground is on the Bible Hill because the place is called Bible Hill, and that is where the Muslims are, are, are buried. Uh, but the, the majority of Muslims live within the, the Halifax, Dartmouth, the, uh, Sackville, and the Bedford area. And um, uh, they say it's about 20 to 22,000. The population of Halifax is about 350,000. It's a small one or less. Um, it is strong uh, in, in, in many ways. We have a couple of masajid. Um, there is Masjid al Umar, there is the, the Center for Islamic Development, there is another one uh, in, in the Dartmouth area over the bridge. There is another one, a uh, little father called Cardi Lake. Um, and uh, 
the Eid, we try all of us to pray in one, in one place because it's relatively small. So uh, it, brings, it brings a big number of Muslims uh, together. Uh, it's, it's vibrant, a lot of work going on. One thing that we do in the community there is um, there is a, a big consciousness about members of the community that, that, that are needy. And um, especially from the center's perspective, if somebody has a need, uh, we don't ask you, bring us your, your, uh, your salary or your social assistance uh, stub or uh, proof to us. We believe nobody, nobody, no Muslim wants to stretch their hand to beg. So if somebody says I'm needy, we take their word, their word for it. Because we don't have millions to give you anyway. And um, so we don't fill forms, we don't take names, we don't take your number, we don't distribute the information. So if Brother Muhammad is dealing with this family, he's the only one dealing with the family. No, we don't get any other person involved, just to dignify Muslims. But the point I'm saying is, um, um, is that I think it is very important for us to have um, to, to, to organize ourselves in a way that we would lift our Muslim uh, uh, brothers and sisters out of difficulty, especially the sisters, especially single mothers who have children. Sometimes the rent is not enough, um, and, uh, and people are dignified, they don't ask, and the Imam should take the responsibility to know who needs and who, who doesn't, and to create the trust so that people can come forward. Um, so that is one thing I think uh, that I don't know how, how other people, how other places do it. And uh, we have two food banks. And um, when you come to the food bank, we know you're not going to sell the food. So you take what you want. Pretty much we stuff you very heavily. And, and, and you go. We know you're not going to sell it. You're going to eat it. So there, really there is no reason to tell you, to, to make you come three, four times when you can just go. If it finishes, the next person will go back again. So we, the imams are professional beggars for the community, pretty much. It is, it is at least, uh, uh, to say the least, if it is called wine. <laughs> and uh, so, so the thing is, to my knowledge, vinegar and wine are very close. All right? I think the process are close in producing them. I think we should all, uh, now I'm talking to myself here, we should learn how they produce, how to produce vinegar and compare it to how, how, how wine is produced. Sometimes they are produced from the same from the same element as well. So, so um, the advice would be if there is other vinegar, because Rasulullah sallallahu said vinegar is something good. It has it has uh, it, 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 it is acidic. Uh, you, you don't take it raw too much because then it might it might eat up your, your your inner organs. But but having it is is good is good for health. So, if there is other vinegar, it's always better to stay away from sugar because Rasulullah told us that when something is doubtful, so the farther you are away from it for your deen, the, the better. And also, the Prophet said, um, anything that when it's in abundance, it intoxicates, when it's little, it's haram. So, if it is real wine in that vinegar, you should avoid it. Does that by some people. So, 
it's, it's, it's a complex issue. Well, it's not complicated, but it's, it's complex. The reason I say it's complex is, um, first of all, we have, to, we have to be very, very careful, even if somebody makes a mistake. If somebody makes a mistake. And, and uh, I'm not saying directly uh, who made mistake and who doesn't make mistake, but from what it appears, many people think Sheikh Hamza is wrong by saying what he said. Okay, just naming him. Even if somebody makes a mistake, among the Sahaba, the Sahaba of Rasulullah, people made grave mistakes. So if we are, we as Muslims, if we are accusing somebody of having done a mistake and we are taking the deen as the yardstick for judging the person, we should also take the deen as a yardstick for, for judging our own reaction, right? right? You can't blame the person of doing mistake but give yourself the liberty of doing, of correcting them wrongly. So, that is one. Secondly, you always have to look at somebody's khayr as compared to the person's mistakes. That is the other thing. Now, that said, that is about the, what, what happened there. That's the, that's the only comment I, I have. Uh, I believe that the downtrodden people, the people who are in difficulty, let's, let's say, people who have disabilities and they're trying to get jobs. You go to workplaces, you don't find people with disabilities very much. Uh, immigrants, Vancouver here is, mashallah, so many immigrants. You go to places where there are less immigrants but they're qualified and they are not working. Only immigrants know what they go through. When you go to places like Nova Scotia where you have black people that have been there for hundreds of years, they are not from Africa. They are from people who run away from slavery and came to Nova Scotia and built communities, but, but for years they have been discriminated against, discriminated against. Only they know what they are going, what they are going uh, through. If you see the Aboriginal people that have been here for as long as anybody knows and what they are going through, only they know. So nobody can dismiss their problems. You cannot dismiss their problems. You, you cannot say they are complaining. You can't take that from them because you are not in their shoes. You are not in their shoes. And for most of us here, I would say at least most of us, we are not born here. And if you've lived in any place where you go for a job and you think you are not treated the way other people are treated, or you go to the airport, you think you are not treated the way other people are, uh, are treated, or you go to university, you think there is some kind of uh, discrimination going on, you know exactly that somebody who is a, a white person from here will not fully comprehend what you're going through. So for them to actually judge the way you feel will just be, will, will, will not be right. So what I'm trying to say is um, uh, you, we people who go through issues know what they go through and only they know the, the extent and the depth and breadth of uh, what they are facing, so we cannot dismiss what they went through. The other thing is, as Muslims, there is one place where we have failed. And we have not done our job in standing up for justice. Whether it happened in Muslim countries, Muslim majority countries, or not. And the examples are countless. The examples are countless. I'm giving you an example of uh, Sierra Leone. I'm from Sierra Leone, by the way. Um, that was a war 10 years. And the population of Sierra Leone is, uh, some say 75, some say 85% Muslim, right? Has anybody heard anybody ever, any imam making dua for Sierra Leone on member for Allah to finish the war? Somebody, some people never knew if the war went on for 10 years, right? We don't have leadership in this. We are called by Allah, Kuntu Khaira Ummah, the best of people, Ukhrijat Liman, that have been sent forth for whom? For everybody. We are here to make sure that justice takes place. So if it is not Palestine, it is not Syria, we have no idea. Even Yemen is not talked about any longer. So we have been driven to focus according to the news because we are not leaders of our own faith in our own news. 
So that is a big gap in, in the Muslims. We don't, we don't have our own research. We don't talk to each other. We meet in the masjid. I don't know where you're from. You don't know where I'm from. I see you, I say salam. You go to work in your engineering. The other one goes to work in their hospital. Because we haven't had this scene and, and the Qatar are mostly, you know, everybody's trying to amass as much wealth as possible. And we don't, we don't know each other. And whatever CNN tells us, then we take it and put it in our head. When the CNN stops talking, who talks about Palestine these days? It's finished. It's not finished, right? But wait until um, the new president of the United States takes over and start talking about Palestine. Then the Alima will start talking about Palestine again. All right? So we are being driven because we are not taking leadership. So the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he says, Kuntu khayra umma. And it's not more, it is not tashrif as much as, it's, as it is taklif. It is not an honor as much as it is a responsibility. It means more like you have been given the responsibility of taking leadership. So we are dropping the ball. We are really dropping the ball. There are oppressed people in this country. There are oppressed people down south here in the United States. You know, one of the countries that have the largest number of prisoners, many of them made up of black people, and Aboriginal people, most of them accepting, many of them accepting Islam while in prison, right? We have no idea, we're not checking, we're not visiting, we don't care, we don't mention. So we're not doing our job, really, we're not doing our job. And we should change that, that should change. If we are to take our place, that should change. Wallahu a'alam, Allah knows best. Uh, gelatin in medicine? Yes, some medicine have gelatin and gelatin. And? Candy. Okay, okay, yeah, so medicines and some candies have gelatin. So, uh, gelatin is a substance that is extracted, I believe, I'm not a scientist, I'm, I'm really not, um, not a, I don't know about these things very much. My understanding is it's, it's, it's derived from from a uh, 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 bowl and it's, it can be derived from animals and uh, it's cheaper to bring it from pork. So if something has gelatin, if we are not sure whether it's from pork or from something else, the best thing is to stay away from it. The best thing is to stay away from it. If they say no, it's from something else that we can consume, then you can have it. But if you don't know, it's better uh, to, to, to leave it alone, especially if there are alternatives. Now, if there is an alternative, there is really no need to go close to it. It's just, 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 just um, stay away from it. But we have to know that gelatin can be, can be taken from pork. It can come from other animals as well. So not every gelatin is haram, but if you don't know because it's cheaper to bring it from pork, so our first assumption is it may have come from pork, so it's better to stay uh, it's, it's better to, to, to leave it and not to, and not to eat it or to feed it to our children. And to also bring it to the consciousness of the children that when they have candy, let them read it. If they read it and find it, that's gelatin. The kids, the kids catch up very easily. If you tell them, they will pay attention. And sometimes they do it with pride. They say, oh, this have gelatin, I, I don't eat it because I know my kids have done it. Is that clear, sister? So, the sister and then you. Uh, to visit students? No, uh, busy students. Like, you know, university students, like, they go over there, like, and make University students that are busy. And, like, in the context of the family as well. Like, how everyone is not busy as well. So they are going to school, but they are busy with family. Wallahi, I think um, um, the, everybody, uh, the, 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 everybody has their own uh, circumstances. Some people um, can, can carry, can multitask, so to speak, can do more than one thing at the same time. Um, uh, it's always 
if you can prioritize, it's always better to see what is your priority, what do you want to do first, if the other, if the other thing can wait. And sometimes you're not, you're not, uh, you don't have the, the latitude of, of doing that. You have to do things uh, at the same time and it becomes, it becomes uh, stressful. I think the, where we have put ourselves or allowed ourselves to be with the so-called education is, uh, is, is very difficult to, to take. The financial stress, the time stress, the family stress, the friendship stress, and the, and the, and the, the pressure that is on you to answer to all this is very, is very hard. And I think it's really, it, it's really high time for us, and I'm saying this with all seriousness, to look at this situation and try to change it by ourselves. Um, I'll give you an example of something we did in Halifax. We opened a school, and the brother sitting here uh, visit the mosque and seen the school. The school is small; it started small, but we decided we have our own philosophy of schooling, and one is um, we we have different criteria for hiring teachers, so we are not hiring. Um, we are not hiring teachers, we are hiring parents who can teach. So your ability to parent and your, the mercy you have for children and how you can interact is the first criteria before we look at what certificate you have. Because we're going to entrust you with our children for eight hours every day. So we're hiring parents who can teach. And, and also, what we teach children to lessen the burden because the pressure is not what brings the, 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 the knowledge. No homework. You finish your work in class. If you don't finish it, then you take it home to finish it. Because we don't want the school to extend into the home. In the home, we have we advise parents to actually encourage the children to work with them, wash dishes, sweep, and see that they have chores at home. So so looking at the child overall instead of just looking at schooling. So we can do that at any level, right? We can take our own condition into consideration. We have enough Muslims, we have enough money, we have enough institutions, so we have enough, enough thinkers. And I'm throwing this at, at, at you, the, the, the upcoming youth, and the ones that are here, as something to think about, because everything starts with the bidra, the little seed of thinking, and and uh, other communities have, have actually done it because it's really it's really a hard life for, for many of our, uh, of our brothers and sisters who are in university. So my advice is uh, maybe prioritize and every single person has uh, their own, um, uh, so you take it case by case. It's hard to give one, one blanket advice. Does that make sense? On the New Year's Eve? New Year's Eve? Yes. Okay. If somebody uh, says you Happy New Year or anything, how do you respond? So if somebody says to you Happy New Year or Merry Christmas or Good Morning or Hi, uh, any greeting that is not Islamic, so what is what do you say? Um, now the, the, <laughs> the bottom line is this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Nisa, وَإِذَا قِيِّتُمْ بِتَحِيَّةٍ فَحَيُّ بِأَحْسَنَ مِنْهَا أَوْ جُوهَا That if somebody sends to you a, 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 a compliment, a greeting, a congratulation, anything that is a good wish, that you have to give them better or return just as much. This is the base for anybody. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, Wa idha sullima alaykum aw sallama, it is a people give you salah. Wa idha uyyitum, if you have been greeted, be tahiyyatin with a greeting, any greeting. Fahayyu, greet back, the ahsana minha with what is better, aw duha or return. So this is the base. So if somebody say good morning, you say good morning, because if you say wa alaykum as salam, he doesn't understand. All right. So if somebody says good morning, there is everything right about saying good morning back or good happy morning for you to add something so you say at least I got what Allah said, give more. And 
If somebody say Happy New Year, it's a new year because the new year is just counting. It's not our new year, but it's a new year. You can say Happy New Year. This is my understanding. Now, Merry Christmas is different because Merry Christmas is a loaded term that means that Isa alayhi salam was born on this date and even the Christians know if he wasn't. And, uh, and that um, we, with everything that it comes with, we, we believe that people should be merry and we don't believe that is what should happen on that day. So, but if you keep quiet, you are creating barrier. If you keep quiet, you are creating barrier. If you respond Islamically, you are creating more barrier. So you respond with something that is nice. So you're not out of the ayah, but you're also not in the hole of accepting that Christmas is to our celebration or something we agree with, right? So I was telling uh, Brother Ahmad that uh, in my in my office, no, no, I think I think I was I was talking to Faiz in my office, and uh, before the Christmas holidays. We were getting all kinds of emails about the celebrations that are taking place. You know, come, we're having, so, so, nobody's forcing you to respond. You can go or you can't go. But I was passing in the hallway and one of my co-workers said, Oh, Muhammad. So I stopped and she went in many envelopes, many envelopes said, Here you go, Merry Christmas. So I opened it. It's a card with the Merry Christmas. You know, very nicely. And today I opened my book. <laughs> Where I read my lectures, I found it in there. I didn't throw it away. <laughs> so it's a Merry Christmas. So I said, thank you very much. And, and I went away. Um, I, and Allah knows I tried before. It didn't work. Because one of my work is to, is to provide um, equitable health for, for minority populations. I'm talking about myself here. For minority populations. And one way is to create an environment that will not alienate people. So if you decorate all over the place with Christmas trees and all of, and all of these things, some people don't, just don't feel comfortable. So I tried preaching this, it didn't work. And you know, that's the alayn in Musaita. I'm not gonna force people and say, stop what you're doing. And uh, so I'm trying for everybody and night comes right at my door. And I was stopped and giving cards. So I took it, I said, thank you. So I'm, I'll be looking for other opportunities to have the discussion. Um, but I didn't respond anyway. But that is me. But I, but the, the baseline is uh, we don't return Merry Christmas or anything that is specific because it will become a tashabu. It will become looking like other people, um, uh, especially when it comes to their religion. We're not allowed to do that according to Islam. That was a long answer. Why I wrote it. Is it okay to say Happy New Year? I, I, I believe that is me saying some, maybe some other person may say uh, uh, something different. It's a new year. Uh, all of us go for January 1st. We know it's a new year. If somebody says uh, it's a happy new year, I want you to be happy. I want them to be happy. I don't want them to be sad. I'm coming from there. And it's not, it's, it doesn't have to do with any religion, all right? Uh, so it, it came from the Roman counting of the, of the years. Um, so Allah uh, Alam. If you can avoid it, it's fine because there is a little shubha. But if somebody faces you and say happy new year, return something. You return something because they are not coming to you with with enmity. They are trying to be to be nice and they are trying to acknowledge you, and they don't know the deal. So you you, you respond with something nice. Inshallah. Uh, I just like to ask, like the knowledge we gain today or maybe the conference, and you get like this iman high or be really like motivated to do good, and how? What do you think the best advice for us to maintain that, at least throughout the year, or at least uh, for the future itself? Yeah, that's a, that's a very big question. How do you maintain your Iman throughout the year? First of all, um, it's impossible. <laughs> it is, right? Because uh, Hanbala came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and uh, uh, he met Abu Bakr, actually. And he was saying, Nafaq, Ahamul, Nafaq, Ahamul. He said, I've become a, a, a hypocrite and so on. And so when we are, they went to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because him and Abu Bakr were having the same thing. So when they are in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Iman level goes up. And when they go home, they see their wives and children, 
you know, they forget some of what, you know, the happiness comes in. So he thought that is hypocrisy. The iman should be at one level. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that, you know, if you have that, what you're saying, then the malaika will actually greet you on the road. So he said, well, like it's sad to facade. So one hour like this with high iman, another hour, you know, with, uh, um, the iman doesn't go, but it doesn't uh, stay constant. It doesn't stay at constantly at the same level. And the ulama said that the iman, so this is this is the answer to your question, that the iman increases with ta'at, with uh, obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it decreases with uh, disobeying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to, to sustain your iman as much as possible, although it will not stay constantly at one place, is to do the ta'at, wasairu ila ma'fara, is to do that watch. Whenever there is avenue, you do it. When you are alone, when you are alone uh, you, you do the of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you remember Allah as much as possible. So your iman rises with those things, and they go down with the, the uh, mass, which is the disobedience of Allah for being with us tonight. SubhanAllah, one of the first guests we had uh, here at the Mac Center in the beginning of 2016 was Dr. Jamal Badawi, also from Halifax. So we conclude the year with Halifax. We started the year with Halifax as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and reward you, inshallah, and uh, accept from you, inshallah. I'll read to you just a brief um, uh, kind of a short description of the talks that Sheikh Muhammad Yabba has at the Generation Muslim Conference, inshallah. The first is titled Beyond the Bubble, and it, it goes as follows What is our role as a community to assist our fellow community members? Sheikh Muhammad Yabba will share how families can partake in da'wah and serve as active members in the community using our Prophet's example to guide the way. Where is our community right now, and where can we be if we were to be in the service of this deen? The next topic, which will be given, I believe, on Sunday, also by Sheikh Muhammad Yafa, is no superiority except. Sheikh Yafa will address the unspoken racial discrimination within our Muslim communities, at times more heavily targeted at specific race groups within our Ummah, unfortunately. Once we identify the current issues of racism and nationalism, what role does each member of the Ummah play in working towards positive solutions to achieve true reconciliation and unity? Sheikh Muhammad will describe how our communities can build on our current successes and strengths to engage in positive problem solving. These are the two topics that will be shared by Sheikh Muhammad Yafa at the Generation Muslim Conference tomorrow oh, so and after. Okay. We ask inshallah to join us tomorrow inshallah yeah. and after and to ensure that we gain from this hope? spark of knowledge a little bit. We'll conclude the night with two rakat of the inshallah. Two rakat, not too much, and then we'll conclude the night with the inshallah. We'll have that in two minutes if anybody wants to make with the inshallah.